Well, I think the fields adopted the idea that risk assessment is important. Um, I think the field beyond that really doesn't know what the tools are exactly. They just pick one that they've heard about and they don't know the pros and cons, the advantages, disadvantages of each of the tools and they're really markedly different in the results that they give. And so I'm hoping that people will become a more critical observer and thinker about risk assessment tools and knowing the underpinnings and what different tools will bring them in terms of results. So they're a better educated consumer about those tools. Uh, the most common, the, the, the two that are, seem to be ubiquitous out there are the opioid risk tool, the ORT, and the, what's called the SOAP or the SOAPR, and it's got an acronym that I can never remember. Uh, and those have been out the longest and tend to be, in, when I'll go through all the booths, they're there. Now they're being embedded in software so that uh, the software will ask the questions. Um, what we know about the ORT is that just given in paper form, it misses a lot of risk uh, folks. It, it doesn't capture data very well, so if you just grab a piece of paper with an ORT and hand it to a patient, you're likely going to miss a lot of risky folks. And there's a couple reasons for that. One is abusers will lie, and then I think it's a little hard to read and literacy becomes an issue. We've done some studies that say that, for example, age on the ORT, 15% of people misrepresent their age because they can't check the box correctly. So it's not just a lying issue, it's an interpretation and attention issue. And then the SOAP and the SOAP R, um, there's different cutoff levels for all those and if you use the SOAP R research cutoff, you're going to miss a lot of risk. If you use the SOAP research level, you're going to catch a lot of people. The SOAP R actually has a couple of different cutoff points and so you need to kind of understand which cutoff level you're using and why and what the pros and cons are. Um, and I think then the bigger issue is using those tools and what, what does it mean if I have a 7 or a 12, what, what do I do with that? And so we're trying to help practitioners understand that next step. Well, I guess I would say I hope a lot of times risk becomes let me catch those addicts. I know there's addicts trying to sneak in here and get these bills or thieves, scammers and we need to sort those people out. And actually risk comes from a lot of different factors. People overtake medicine, they have impulse control, they're not sleeping, they don't understand, there's literacy issues, there's all kinds of reasons why people cannot take their medicine as prescribed. And I think risk needs to become that bigger pool, not just find the addicts, but look at risk in a, in a more behavioral sense and, and then trying to work with people about why they're doing that. I actually think one of the items we don't, or the questions that we don't ask soon enough or often enough is where do you keep your medicine and has it ever gone missing? Uh, have you ever lost any or had it stolen? Uh, diversion is a huge issue and none of the current risk tools or few of the risk tools currently ask that question and practitioners need to do that. That's a huge issue that we need to be asking patients about. So if risk comes from diversion issues then you talk about safe storage and who stole it and where are you keeping it. If it comes from overtaking issues, then you get into expectations and um, other ways to deal with pain besides popping another pill. Um, so it really, if you can get risk more multidimensional and address what's driving the risk, you're going to be a lot more effective in your treatment outcomes. Well, there, there's the ongoing issue, and there's a few tools out there now um, that aren't really risk prediction tools. And so we really haven't got there yet in terms of risking or assessing risk in people in long-term treatment. Um, we maybe are assessing people in the beginning, but after a year of treatment or two years of treatment, what do you do then? I'm actually becoming of the opinion that it's behavior that you ought to assess. You don't need a tool or an inventory. You just watch them for a year, count their pills, check their drug screens, check their pharmacy report. Most people sort themselves out after a year. They're either successful or not after a year. If they're going to mess up, they're going to mess up in the first year, usually, about two-thirds, three-quarters. Um, so it might be we don't need a tool later in treatment. We need to monitor them and then adjust treatment based on their behavior without getting another score. Okay, yeah, unfortunately, a lot of times, uh, 
risk is, oh, they're high risk, so I don't give you any opioids, or I need to refer you someplace else. And actually, for some practitioners, that's a great idea. They're really ill-equipped to handle a high-risk patient, and they need to know their limits and say, this is, I'm in over my head. I don't need to start opioid therapy and end up in a problem situation. Let me refer you to here or there. Um, if you do treat somebody with opioids in a high risk, again, if you know more about where the risk is coming from, and then figure out what you need to do. More frequent visits, less doses per day, or less doses per month, uh, long-acting versus short-acting, should I use abuse deterrent uh, formulations, should I concomitantly prescribe naloxone, um, there's a lot of good issues in there. If it's a diversion issue, then you can talk about safe storage. So there's a number of factors to consider. I, I think the one particular issue that comes us for up a lot is uh, use of opioids with people that have a history of addiction. And there's no standard protocols for that, and, and that's a real problematic issue. Um, we know a number of people have used to have addiction issues, even alcoholism. So if you have a recovering alcoholic and they've been sober 10 years, are they still at risk and what kind of treatment plan interventions might you have for that versus somebody that's been sober five years, sober one year, are they working a recovery program, are they not working a recovery program? Those are all factors to consider and then making treatment decisions based on that. It might be somebody with long-term sobriety with a good recovery support system could take long-acting opioids effectively. Um, other people maybe not. So former addicts and alcoholics a lot of them have pain. A lot of them, there's no other treatments that could be used. So uh, maybe opioids need to be implemented, but very judiciously and with uh, great thought.